Well, thank you everyone for coming and being here at this wonderful event. It's always a tough act to follow after my good colleague Mario. I am not speaking for Forest Hills. I'm speaking to you as myself. Um, I'd like to share with you a couple of things about how you get from being a, just a conventional community to something like what Mario is doing, what we're trying to do in Forest Hills. Um, I don't know who's changing these. I'm going to be marching oh, okay. back and forth, yeah, I guess. Here, let me. Okay. So I want to talk to you job. about my approach to economic development. I've been doing it for many, many years. First of all, it's empowering the community. If a community isn't feeling the need to make a change and feeling some cohesion about it, very, very difficult to make a change in any direction. You have to have something that does that. And you have to really keep the perspective of your history. You are going to be unique in whatever community you're in. And you need to capture those important parts of the things that make you unique, your roots, your history. And how do you then amplify and modify that going forward? Yes? I think you lost your mic. Yeah, it's red. Oh, it's red. It should be green. I think your battery's dead. I, I killed the battery. OK, oh, no. well, let me just okay. carry that one around. Okay. I'm sorry. Is that better? Yeah. OK. All right, so you want to have the perspective of history so that you maintain the unique character of your own community. You do the analysis, of course, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. You can call them roses, thorns, and buds. They have all kinds of nomenclature, depending on the consultant you hire. But the basic concept is you can do this yourself around your tables. I know, Mario, you had hundreds of charrettes. Community meetings, we did lots of them, too. And you need to know what you're going to measure. How do you know if you're making progress or not? What gets measured gets done. It can be simple, it can be complicated, but if you don't have these four things in your community change project, it isn't going to work. Okay, we need to understand what we're up against here, people. <laughs> this is do or die time. Okay, the ways of the past are going to kill us, and you heard Terry Collins talk about that a little bit this morning. Do not underestimate the magnitude of the problems and the challenges that we face. The laws of nature are not negotiable at all. The laws of nature are going to prevail, and we either go along the line that aligns our behavior with something that will be viable in the natural world, or we will not survive. Okay, next. So the most important thing you need to do is to develop a driving vision forward. This is not a technology problem. This is a values problem. This is a ethics problem. This is a problem of how you confront the challenges to our survival for the future. It takes relying on the intellectual capital of your community, the shared wisdom that you have all invested from your life. It involves teamwork and collaboration. Nobody does this alone. It involves empowering that entrepreneurial innovation. Then you end up with needing to understand the basics, the things that are priceless, absolutely essential for our life. Clean air, pure water, fertile ground, the biodiversity of species, the healthy ecosystem that we rely on in order to be alive. These are all under stress right now. And understanding the stressors in your community, they may be different in, in magnitude in different places, but fossil fuel combustion, hyperconsumption, which generates so much waste, resource extraction as a base for our economy, the population pressure. If everyone in the world lived the way we do in our country, it would be five and a half or six planets worth of resources, and we only have one. So we need to make an adjustment on this fundamental survival concept. Now, understanding the system, it means that you need to appreciate that the way our economy works takes raw material and sends it to trash. This is not sustainable. We're burning up fossil resources that cre we're creating the oxygen we rely on in the first place. 
as you burn it, you change the balance of our atmosphere. And the environmental pressure that results from reversing in decades processes that took millions of years, we do not have time to adapt to that rapid level of change. We are about 6% of the world's population, and we use about 34% of the world's resources. We take our modern world, modern conveniences, and turn them to things that kill things. This is an albatross that has been eating plastic, and our oceans are filled with about 500 pounds of plastic per person. Our modern habitat has become congested, noisy, polluted, and stressful. And there is another way forward. We need to understand that we are part of the natural world, the ecosystem, that little fragile, gossamer, shimmering edge of the living mantle of the earth that Terry Collins talked about earlier. That is what is real. But the laws that drive our economy, that drive our daily interactions, they're written over there in the economic system. And this is an entirely artificial construct about how we value the things that we produce, either primarily or secondarily in the middle. It is man-made laws that are not in alignment with the ecosystem laws. All of these services that the natural world provides to us, I'm not going to read these all to you, but these things if you look at where they are in the value chain of our economy, are given very little, if any, value at all. The ecosystem services that are the life support system of our planet, if you look at the, um, well, the economic value of them is less. In order to have a balanced way forward in your community, the economy, the society, the environment have to be balanced equally. It has to have justice and equitability and fairness. It has to be efficient. It has to be healthy. If you were to graph the way our system is working today, that economic circle would be about four times bigger than everything else because we count dollar flow. We count profits. We count gross domestic production. And we don't put value on those things that make us human. The society values, the culture, the history, the people-to-people -people issues are not things that are counted. <coughs> the value of the environment, all those ecosystem services that we rely on, do not show up in the equation. This equation determines how much our economy is doing well and whether that investment made by industry is in something that is going to cause a devaluation in your health or a destruction of your environment, or a destruction of your community down the road 20 years, or not, it still counts as a plus. If you have to rebuild whole towns because a hurricane has wiped it out, it still counts as a plus. But certainly, culturally, this is not a plus. If you've had your personal mountain stripped away and turned into a, the, the waste dumped into your stream, and all the houses that were there before were foreclosed and removed, that is not a plus for that community, but it does look as a plus if all you measure is the gross domestic product. So you have to come up with a metric that reflects the values that are important to your community, whether or not they are strictly dollar values. So we have a whole movement of mayors around the country that are looking at sustainability and, rely and resilience as a way forward. There are 1,060 mayors so far uh, in the US Congress of Mayors. And 75% of them expect to increase to a clean energy by 2020, using LED lighting, as we've heard, solar and wind energy, and efficiency improvements in their cities. This is a growing movement. It is not going to be stopped by any policies that happen at the federal level. Go ahead. A lot of them are using their efficiencies at public buildings. They are improving their outdoor lighting. They're improving the energy efficiency of water treatment plants. This is the Chicago Green Work Roof Initiative. You can look all over the place now and find them. Uh, there was just a report issued by the Sierra Club of 10 
cities that are going to be 100% renewable energy. And one of them was Las Vegas. So I tell you that it's not out of the realm of possibility. There are many in California, but go ahead. Five to 100% renewables you know, are goals that are represented across the country. You don't need to go to 100% right away. All you need to do is start. And typical targets are from five, 15 to 20% renewables by the year 2020. You can come up with an estimate that makes sense for your community. The main thing is to get the whole conversation in motion and understand why this is a critical change. OK, so we've heard the sustainability definition. This is the one that was adopted by the World Commission on the Environment and Development in Our Common Future in 1985. It, there have been a lot of definitions of sustainability, but this one is the one that holds uh, the most. And it's an existential challenge, and it's an intergenerational challenge. Um, this is my granddaughter, uh, very proudly making her very first all by herself loaf of bread. And I would like to hope that she has a daughter to pass on the making of bread to in her life. And you know, we've had this artificial dichotomy, especially in this part of Pennsylvania, you know, where we've had coal as the center of the economy in our, in our state for so long. The myth that if you save the environment or protect the environment that you're going to give up jobs. Absolutely not true. Leo Gerard, uh, Steelworkers Union president, has often said this, and he said it as recently as last week. Although it does also promote a lot of other stuff, he thinks that you need to have a clean environment or you will have neither. If you don't have both, we will have neither. So what we need to do is to look at those places of synergy where we can have both good environmental outcomes and good job outcomes. And the transition from the ways of the past to the ways of the future. We are in the middle of that transition. It is in process all around us. This is not a myth. This is not a theoretical construct. If you have only question you have to answer is, are you going to be part of the advanced way of the transition, or are you going to wait till you're dragged screaming later? <laughs> and you know that this was a difficult thing. When people started out the transition from horse and buggies to vehicles that looked pretty much like buggies, right? They had all kinds of problems. The roads had to be paved, because horses didn't need to have a paved road, but the cars got stuck. You needed to have a whole fuel supply system. You know, horses eat hay and generate manure, but they had this petroleum stuff. It tended to burn down your barn. You had, couldn't get it everywhere. It wasn't real easy to handle. There was all of the rules of the road Horses don't deliberately run into each other normally. People, I'm not so sure. You know, so okay, you get to drive on this side, or if you're in Europe on that side, you know, and you have to stop when the light is red, and you know, all of these rules, and provide license for the vehicles and license for the drivers, all of that infrastructure. It didn't happen like that. It happened over the course of a couple of decades, but within 20 years, you would not have as many horses on the road because of the convenience and all these other things. But the infrastructure has to be attended to if we're going to accelerate the use of renewable energy instead of a fossil base. You have to attend to the interface with the utilities. Every state has its own set of rules, and they vary tremendously from state to state. We have a tremendous amount of issues with insurance and financing. If you try to build a passive solar house, for example, or a passive solar municipal building, you have zoning variances. You need 16 or 18 exemptions from code. It's very, very complicated, and it doesn't need to be. I mean, you can adopt a, a streamlining ordinance, which we've adopted in our town, um, and other places have done as well. But you have to attend to that regulatory interface in order to make it easier. Banks are skeptical, OK? You need to put up a house, and it's not going to have a furnace in it. How are you going to get a building inspector to sign off on that thing? You know, what happens when it gets cold out? Well, you know, the geothermal energy works all year round, whether or not it's cold out. 
and you know you have to now prove it. You go through all of these extra hoops, but little by little, little by little, we can make progress on that. Thanks. And everybody talks about the bridge fuel, and we've been going into a fever over the shale revolution and all the stuff that's going to happen. That's still a fossil fuel. And if it's a bridge, the question that I keep bringing is, what is on the other side? Where's the pillar on the other side of the river that we're aiming for? And who's putting up that post that we're building the deck to? And how long are we going to take to get there? That is a question you can answer in your communities when you're planning your way forward. What are you aiming for on the other side of that bridge that's to the future, someday, somewhere out there. You have to look in a very practical way. What are the resources you have? What are the things that are available right now? What needs to change in order for progress to happen? And again, that's a different answer in different places because you all face different conditions to start with. And the technologies are, are you know, variable, but they're adaptable to different places. But what's right for one place may not be right for another. If you're in a desert, you're not going to have the same solution as a person on a coastal town. If you're in a rural area, you're not going to have the same issues and problems as a city. But you have different kinds of options, no matter where you are. And you can always come up with something that'll work. And you need to look at the really fundamental ethical issue that underlies all of this, which is that the rights of the living earth matter too. You can't just structure this around the economy alone. You have to look at what it is that really matters going forward. You know, the diversity of creatures is what supports our life, ourselves. And if we destroy habitats that make it impossible for the diversity of creatures to exist, you're also reducing our own options forward. And it's also a matter of justice. You know, Terry was talking about caring about the people we don't see. Well, a lot of those people are on the other side of the world or beyond our borders. And we are somewhere up here. Okay, and we are responsible for about half of the output of the global warming problem. And the poorest half of the world only contributes about 10%. So they are suffering the costs the problems that burdens, and we are causing most of the problem ourselves. So the other issue is the causes of pollution are things that we are creating more problems for if in the places that are still not developed. So when you look at all of these things that we look at as convenience food, comfort food, fast food, a lot of them have palm oil in them. And the rainforests that are cut down in order to make palm oil plantations so that you can have potato chips and fast food that's oversalted and really bad for you. I mean, does this make any sense? Are we willing to send entire species extinct so we can have potato chips? Really? <laughs> and things that go into your face lotion and your hand lotion and your hair stuff, all of these little undigestible ones. Well, Terry could list you all of what they are that they put in things that you use every day, and most of them you don't want to have all over you. Anyway, thanks. The geographic disparities are also having national effects, but not just outside of our country. The Maldives Islands, for example, are in fact submerging. Bangladesh is at sea level, and there are going to be millions of people displaced if the water rises even five inches. But we've also experienced it here on our own coastal cities, in our own farmlands that are experiencing droughts, we have already been experiencing the effects of climate change and global warming. This is not a time to say, this isn't our problem. We don't need to deal with it here because it isn't here yet. So you also have future generations to look at. This is a little girl pushing her doll. In, this is taken at Ryerson State Park. Um, near the Ryerson Coalfield, the uh, Bailey 7-8 mine. Um, these children need to look at their own future with a positive eye. Just because they've always mined coal, again, you look at the history of that land, they were dairy farmers. 
and the land that hasn't been mined already is still there. That ethic of care and connection to the land is still there. It's part of our American culture. The pioneers went west to farm. You know, we were a farming nation for many, many years. And only after the Second World War did the migrations into the city shift that balance. And the mechanization of farming shifted that balance. But the connection to the land needs to be restored because that is where you find your roots. That is where you find your reason for living and your connection to the living earth as it is. So you need to address the real needs of real people. And this is the uh, refugees at the Tur Turkish border. Climate refugees, because the drought of six years drove many of these people from their farm communities into cities that had no social infrastructure to deal with the influx in large numbers, and so they migrated and left. Harbinger of our future, if we have another dust bowl for another six or seven years of drought in our own country, we will have a disruption of our ways of providing food across our own country. This is not somebody else's problem somewhere else. These are justice issues that we need to deal with now while you have time to address in prevention. You have to look at things like workers' rights and health conditions and economic disparities. These are things that cause revolutions if you don't attend to them, okay? If you only pay attention to the economic profitability as your single metric, you are indeed going to get the top 5% getting richer and richer. But the rest of us are going to get madder and madder. And that is the nature of revolution. You need to attend to these justice issues as you look at planning forward for your community, because this is what matters to people. So, okay, how much time do I have? Okay, I'm, this is not pretty pictures. We're down to the nitty gritty of how do you go about this? Okay, if you were going to hire a consultant, uh, you'd pay them ten or fifteen thousand dollars, and they would do this kind of a process for you. You may or may not get a result you could use. But if you want to do an interactive community process, you can actually do this. The main thing is to know where you want to go. Next. You have to build a positive vision for your community. Now, how do you do that? And you better take some good note because when we get to the exercise part of this, I'm going to make you do this. Okay, so take note. Okay? You have to get the right group of people together. They have to have enough influence in the community so that when they come back and say, this is what we deliberated and this is what we found, people actually care. It matters. Uh, if you have you know, yourself and four neighbors, unless you have really lucky to have influential neighbors, you can come back and say, well, this is what we decided. And everybody's going to say, oh, yeah, and who are you and why do I care? But if you get the relevant players, figure out who has the power and make sure those people are at the table, even if you have to drag them. And you have to look at what are your shared values. Look at that history piece. What is it that makes our community matter? Why do we care about what our vision for the future looks like? What are the things that have to be in there that we want to keep and build on? And get feedback. Have community meetings. And I'll tell you, um, I lived in Anchorage, Alaska for a number of years. And I was in the Economic Development Corporation as the chair. And we did a 2020 vision for the year 2000. This was 1998. And we needed to get community feedback. They had close to 1,000 people involved in this process. The mayor was a marketing man, and he dragged everybody in. But how are you going to get feedback from the working groups, from the people at large? Well, we went to the boat show. January in Anchorage, everybody goes to the boat show because they're planning for their next fishing trip, which can't come soon enough in March. So we went to the boat show and we had a U-shaped, you know, exhibit area with lots of sheets of paper on it, labeled by community. So we had Muldoon and Northern Lights and down, to, you know, all over. And people would go to their neighborhood designated area and write on the sheets of paper what they saw as their vision for their community. And then that's how we started to get community feedback. You have to go where people are. 
you can't hold it in the town hall at seven at night and you know seven to nine at night presided over by some consultant nobody heard of and doesn't know who isn't from the town you, you need to go where people are and get them engaged and you need to encourage people to work together get them to have some skin in the game you know you need to have yourself there and say okay you're the people who are running the businesses on our main street what can we do to make this better? And where do you want to have this Main Street be in 20 years? And get them to give you their idea. They're going to know the problems a lot better than any planner from Montana that came in to do the plan. Um, and you have to value your citizen input. You may not agree with them, but if they're all head up over something, like when we were doing the, the charrette for our new town hall, we had 30 people show up who were upset over the atom smasher. Okay, this is like the Westinghouse Adam Smasher that's on a piece of property that's not in use right now. It's been knocked down. It's like somebody's trying to figure out how to demolish the thing, but it's you know impossible to break. We want to restore the Adam Smasher. It's a hallmark of our town. What do you mean you knocked it down? I mean, we had 30 people all upset about this. It's like, okay, wild card, out of the blue. But you have to take count. How do people value what they see of it as the character of their town? And you have to listen to that. So real economic health. Invest in your local people. I mean, you heard our colleague from Hassa talking about how local farms create local value. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. Connecting to higher education, connecting to your schools, filling your local government positions with local people. I mean, how many times do you have a fire department and they all live somewhere else? Or you have your public works department, only two of them are in town. You know, hire the people that live where you are. And investing in the neighborhood organizations, the health of your organization, uh, the people who are running the civic life of your community. These people need to have the confidence that their community counts what they do and values it and gives it back. And protecting the local environment is absolutely critical. It's critical to the health of the people who live there. It's critical to the way people perceive the community. And it's critical to the long-term well-being of that community as it grows. If you can make sure you're going to have conditions that protect healthy water and air and land, then you're going to have a better way forward. Next. OK, land use, wise use of the land. You have all kinds of things that press on our land use. Um, you want to pave it and put a building up and put it in the tax base. But when you're doing that, look at how you can make things have walkable corridors, community access, permanently protecting those valuable things like valuable farmland and forests and open space and any unique features in a community that are important to preserve for the future and look at it, the development that you put in as how it will affect the life of the community. So when you put in a road, if that's going to cleave down the center of your view community and make one side practically unreachable from the other side, it has a totally devastating effect on the future fate of that town. And this has happened to my town long before, and you know we struggle with that more than anything else. Ardmore Boulevard is a death trap. And you know, you just can't do anything about it. It's a state road. We would need an act of the legislature to move it. <laughs> so, good information. Difficult these days. We don't have a community newspaper anymore that comes out every week. They don't cover little towns. We're a little town too. You know, we have only five thousand people. How do you communicate with your constituents? It's a big problem. And all the social media in the world don't get through to the people who aren't on the internet. You have to find a way to communicate with each other. And that means you have to go again where people are. The information that you compile, OK, you're going to need data. But charts and graphs aren't necessarily the only way to communicate this data. You have to go to the farmer's market and put out things that people can see and help them visualize what is going forward. And here I'm talking about that, and I don't have any pictures in this part of the presentation. But it was like, I had two, two little, 
Um, and you need to disseminate the information in an accessible fashion. So sometimes that means you go to the Rotary Club, you go to the Garden Club meeting, you go to the church groups, you go to the fire department, you know, volunteer department meetings, you go to the police auxiliary, you know, you go to where people are in your town and you talk to them and say, okay, this is what's going on, this is where we are, what can you do in the way of input and just let them know anyway. You have to have a way to give meaningful information. And the metrics have to be understandable. So you can talk about, okay, we're going to reduce our consumption of municipal buildings by 10% per year for 10 years. Okay, that's pretty cool. You can figure that out. All right, so I tried to do that. Our municipality has something like 15 buildings including little sheds on the parks, and they all have a different electric bill. <laughs> Three or four of them have their own gas bill. Um, they come in at different, you know, places. Uh, no one person gets all of the bills until I have to sign off of them as finance chair. And I'm going, well, how do I know what the actual energy bill for the whole town is for all these buildings? Well, I had to get an intern to go through and chart all this stuff and digest it down and add it up, and it isn't mechanized, and it's you know really frustrating. And I remembered back in Cheshire, Connecticut, we had a League of Women Voters project for energy efficiency, and we were taking dollhouses around to the schools that the students had to weatherize, and we gave them tips for energy savers to help them do that at their house, but what we did was we developed a thermometer for each municipal building and each school. And we put, this is what your school is using, and we want to get it down to half of that. And you're in competition with that school over there, and this is how much they're using. <laughs> and we had all these various buildings in the town with thermometers on them, and we would draw lines on them every month to see, you know, and we did the weather adjustment so that, you know, it wasn't the weather variation. But it really did create a lot more awareness in the town. And you know what we found out? The library had a long handicap access ramp. And in the middle of the summer, the snow melt device had not been turned off. Wow. <laughs> so in the summertime, their electric bill was through the roof because they not only were air conditioning, but they were also melting the ice. So this is the kind of thing you find out when you do your metrics. And I have five things to go and I have five minutes, so I can either take a brief, big breath and, anyway, we're gonna see. Uh, think about long range. Don't plan for tomorrow, plan for your grandchildren's tomorrow. Next. Uh, in planning for efficiency, the technology today makes zero net energy, zero net water, absolutely doable. We're doing one in our town. We have a zero net energy building going up as a borough building. It is within budget, it is doable, and it's going to pay for itself over the life of it. Um, neighborhoods walkable. This is something that takes some advanced planning. It takes some adaptation of things that have been priorities in the past. But if you don't do it, you get a less healthy community, a less connected community, People know each other when you walk the way you don't know each other when you drive by. So it makes a big difference in the nature of the community. And rather than go through great detail of the last two ones, I want to talk about why this is so important going forward. A lot of the innovations that are coming at us in the way of work changes involve increasing mechanization, your point of service, um, in fast food places, for example, self-service in all kinds of places. Assemble your own thing when it arrives in the mail. You know, we are going to have a difference between where and how we work. You're on the internet, and you work out of your house, your job is somewhere else. But your community, where you live, the people that you connect to on a daily basis, this is where you live, your life is centered on your community. And if that community is supportive of people and supportive of those relationships that make life worth living, neighbors that know each other and take care of each other, people who are concerned about whether or not you're healthy, 
someone who notices that your elderly neighbor hasn't picked up his paper for two days and goes and says, ah, are you okay? You know, rather than waiting for some impersonal health service agency. These kinds of things make the difference between a community and a, just a building. So, um, go quickly, preserving unique features we talked about and recognizing the limits. Growth for its own sake isn't necessarily a good thing. So you need to know how big you want your community to be, what is the nature of growth, and having value, having goodness, having well-being, and preserving a way of life that it reinforces those things doesn't necessarily mean infinite growth in the gross domestic product. You have to define what matters as your growth parameters and as your values, and then you will have a resilient community. Next. So I close with Rachel Carson. Those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. Connect to the natural world and take courage to defend and protect the living earth and all the things that are on it, and then you will have a good tool. Thanks. These are my grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> and my motivation and my joy.